Everything's bigger in Texas. Donuts, toast, barbecue. It might actually just be the food that's bigger in Texas. They've even got those jovial steakhouses where if you can eat a full 72 ounce steak in one hour, it's free. I found a restaurant that set up a live stream cam so you can watch people chow down on this eating challenge 24 hours a day. Now, unfortunately for me, no one decided to take the challenge on at 10.34 p.m. Texas time, probably because the restaurant closed four minutes ago, but I decided to keep watching. I watched these two guys clean up and break down the kitchen for over 40 minutes and I gotta say I think they missed the spot yep there it is right there but don't worry fellas I'll be back tomorrow and I'll be watching and waiting I'll see you bright and early at 10 a.m. Texas time. Anyway, one time a Texas railroad company decided to crash two trains into each other at high speed purely for a publicity stunt. And the funny part is, the train crash itself isn't even what made the event another bullet point on the everything's bigger in Texas list. Why? Because train crashing actually used to be a super dope event that happened back in the late 1800s. And the one in Texas that I'm talking about just so happened to be the one that took things to the next level. We used to crash trains for fun all the way until a certain historical event ruined everything for everyone. And then shortly after, people just kind of forgot about trains after the car industry shoved their long dick of an assembly line down America's throat. You don't believe me? When was the last time you got to buy a ticket to an intentional train crash? Never. Our entertainment industry sucks absolute dick today. Enjoy whatever bullshit you find on your smartphone. I'm going to spend my days daydreaming about how we could have had a world where we eventually were slamming 200 mile per hour bullet trains into each other. But let's start where everything starts. History. We gotta explain this entire locomotion commotion before we can get to the carriage carnage catastrophe that capitulated crowds to their common conservative senses to censor the superb pastime. We'll hop in our time machine all the way back to 1895, careful not to set the dial to 1985, because we might land in one of those months when new coke was introduced, and I don't really even drink soda, I just really hate change. A.L. Streeter was a railroad equipment salesman in 1895 in Illinois, and he realized people just weren't buying enough railroad equipment. As far as I found, there's no photographs of A.L. Streeter anywhere, so I used newfangled AI technology to generate an image of what he might have looked like. According to AI, Streeter looked like one of these four images that you see on the screen. I'm going to go ahead and pick this one, because for some reason the AI thinks that I also was in the back driving trains with him at the exact same time, and that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. Anywho, Streeter spent his days rubbing his tired, crazy eyes, wondering, ugh, what can I do with trains that's never been done before? How can I drum up a new market for train parts? He pondered and pondered and pondered, and then he realized the only reason people buy railroad equipment and train parts is when they need new ones. And the people who already own train parts only need new ones when the ones that they have break. Why not get people to break some trains? So here came the express engine of an idea. Smash trains into each other, charge people money to watch, and then sell train parts to people who wanted to do it themselves. Hell, sell the whole railroad, since people are gonna wanna set it up like a circus has come to town. It is genius, foolproof, with no downsides whatsoever. Everyone hates trains, and everyone loves money. It is the perfect capitalist symbiosis. In July of 1895, Streeter called up every single railroad company in Illinois and told them of his brilliant idea, and every single one of them said, what the actual fuck is wrong with you? We need those trains to keep our business in operation. The fact that people could die or get hurt is a second but much less important concern. It's something we have to pretend to care about, but mostly we need the trains. So Streeter did what everyone does when they need to relocate to somewhere that doesn't give a shit. He took 
his idea to Cleveland, Ohio, and there the struggling Cleveland, Canton, and Southern Railroad decided to let him try his idea because the word Cleveland was in their name so you knew that they were desperately struggling. Now it was time to start blowing the roof off with hype and getting everyone poggers, which was an old 1800s term for excited like a minority. It's a horrible slur and we don't use it anymore, but that's back when people used to use that word. I really hope that word isn't used today in common culture because that's what it means. Streeter ran the following ad in a series of Ohio newspapers. Two monster locomotives with full head of steam starting a mile apart will rush towards each other at a rate of 60 or 70 miles an hour and allowed to come together with a crash that will result in the most horrible head-on collision ever seen or heard of. It will enable those present to note the terrible effects of a railroad horror. It will take place in an enclosure and the public will be free from all danger. Everybody should see this exhibition. Damn, I really wish that old-timey advertising was still a thing because I could just yell Come see the YouTuber with an ego, the size of which only matched by his penis. And I'd get tens of thousands of viewers. I would be the perfect candidate for this. The 20th of July rolls around, and two miles southeast of Canton, Ohio, the Cleveland, Canton, and Southern Railroad sections out a piece of their track for the crash. Mechanics hired by Streeter find two decommissioned locomotives and turn them into Destruction Derby contestants. Of destruction. The trains were painted red, white, and blue to remind all the spectators that America is the only country that'll ever do something this cool, and they were named Protection and Free Trade to remind citizens of what the government pretends to give them every single day in this wonderful nation. Okay, sometimes I'm not funnier than actual history. Protection and Free Trade were two hotly debated economic theories back in the late 19th century. So imagine if this stunt was done today, and the two trains were named Capitalism and Communism. It's pretty funny. But you know what isn't funny? Compromise safety measures. And that's exactly what got the entire event canceled before it even happened, which is stupid because everyone knows that safety always pales in comparison to realizing that your death is coming no matter what, so you may as well just do everything. Streeter built a high fence around the predicted crash area and charged people 75 cents to witness the carnage from behind it. Now that's about $25 today, and you're goddamn right I would pay that much to watch two 20 ton machines slam into each other at high speed. What else am I gonna do? Play Fortnite? The only train that comes from Fortnite is the one I run on your mother in the other room that finally gets to happen because you earn that $25 V-Bucks card for your birthday, which acts as the perfect distraction to get a child of divorce out of the room. Now, unfortunately, offense is just offense. It's really not gonna do anything to stop anyone who wants to circumvent said fence. Even worse is if the fence is one of those that you can just see through, which this one happened to be because people were gonna stand behind it and watch the event for safety reasons. So what stops people from just not paying and then standing behind the fence? It'd be pretty hard to tell in a crowd of thousands of people. Streeter tried to get the amassing crowd to follow the rules, but unfortunately for Streeter, this wasn't Japan. If this was Japan, the public would have formed a fully orderly line, each making sure that everyone paid the admission and everyone was obeying all safety instructions to the letter. If you don't believe me, here's a collage of articles on how good Japan is at standing in lines now. And you know what, as a little added bonus, here's a time lapse of a massive crowd trying to get into a nationally famous comic book convention in Japan. God damn, they are the masters of conformism. No, the problem for Streeter was, as Childish Gambino once put it in that mega popular worldwide musical hit video single that he created, I'm doing big things like I'm eating out a whale. And when you do something as large as this, there's only one country where it can happen. The country where waiting in line is for idiots, paying for things is for suckers, and obeying safety advisories is for pussies. This is America. Oh wow, that, that last line was really poignant. Someone should really make a song out of that. Instead of paying the admission fee, people did literally anything else. They snuck to areas around the crash site that weren't walled by the fence, they climbed nearby trees, and perhaps most unprecedented of all, they just walked right up to the fence without paying. Or climbed on it and like sat on it. 
because it's a fucking fence. And thus, in the typical play of people didn't follow the rules, so now Christmas is canceled forever, the entire event had to be shut down because control over the crowd was lost and firing the trains off would just straight up be hundreds of hundreds of counts of manslaughter. Even bigger of an oopsie fucking whoopsie, Streeter was told that he'd have to pay a $2,400 permit to intentionally crash trains on the railroad tracks. His initial projections for the crowd attending was at about 20,000 people. And while that amount may or may not have actually shown up in the end, the amount of people who actually paid the entry fee was... 200. So he didn't pull this one off. Now, humorously enough, the Cleveland, Canton, and Southern Railroad was running an express ticket deal on another train of theirs to take people to the crash site for 15 cents. Now for that, virtually no one got a refund, so everyone who attended the event was utterly pissed. The dream of smashing two trains together was dead, and the rest of this video is just gonna be me reacting to TikToks to pad out runtime. Is what I would say if I didn't have a shred of self-respect left, and if Americans weren't also really, really good at blowing stuff up. Streeter knew that the general public of the great United States would fork over lots of dough to senselessly clobber huge masses of steel and metal. He had to try again. He just had to figure out the logistics this time. So now it's a year later, and it's Memorial Day, and people know the best way to honor the memory of men and women who died in horrifically bloody ways in wars that they most likely didn't even believe in is to smash some motherfucking choo-choo trains together. This time around, the smash zone was much more well-equipped to handle a large crowd and keep them safe, and most importantly, to gouge them for their hard-earned dollars. So now it was time to go bigger. Now it was time to make this shit ridiculous. Besides just slamming two locomotives into each other face first, Streeter also hooked each steam engine to three cars filled with coal and a caboose. He named one train after himself, A.L. Streeter, and the other, W.H. Fisher, who was a rival train company's executive. Let me cut in a bit here with some expert analysis. I didn't see any historians point this out in the research I did, but it's actually pretty brilliant to name a train after yourself when you're the man who completely failed to deliver both a spectacular show and refunds to a crowd of thousands of people. I'm gonna bet there were rumors and advertising of this event everywhere that said, A.L. Streeter to be demolished and horrific train crash explosion. Most likely a good number of people showed up thinking that this was a public execution in the most radical of styles. Oh, and Streeter also had one last trick up his sleeve before he changed the TR in his name to a K and became an anthropomorphic puppet on a successful Nickelodeon sitcom. In the original publicity stunt that got canceled because people thought the best way to see a train crash was by standing directly on the train tracks, Streeter's plan was for a conductor to hop into each train, simultaneously set them off at full speed ahead, and jump out. Once the trains were like an anime woman's hips, that is, moving on their own, they'd sprint away to safety. Streeter decided that that was a little too... whatever for his second All Systems Go launch. In his final act of showmanship, he filled each five-car train with dummies of people dressed in railroad company uniforms. Now, did he tell the audience he was going to do that? No. Did he own up to the fact that they were dummies and not real people after the crash? Crash? No. Did that make for one hell of a show? You're goddamn right it did. The crowd at the time reported that they thought the dummies were real people and that the engineers had failed to disembark the locomotives in time. Skeeter's final gambit to make up for his initial failure was to convince people they had just witnessed a 40 ton, 40 mile per hour explosive murder. Listen Listen to your parents when they say entertainment really was better back in my day because I fully and utterly believe them now. The crash
Smash was a huge success. Newspapers all over the nation commented on how this was the coolest thing ever since Utah was admitted as the 45th state earlier that year, because let's face it, everything in history has been more exciting than anything Utah has ever done. It was around this time the crowd cheered and began carrying Streeter on their shoulders going, Streeter, 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 and then the credits began to roll and they were smushed to one side of the screen and the cable announcer came on and said, premiering Saturday at 7, 6 central, it's the premiere of Xenon Girl of the 21st Century. Disney's latest original movie stars a far out teenager who's the center of her own universe. Living on a space station can be hectic major, especially when she has to stop a big corporate bigwig from destroying her home. She's one galactic gal who saves the day in a stellar way, premieres Saturday at 7, 6 central. Streeter was then brought on board by entertainment companies, promotional organizations, and other railroads across the country to put on more acts like this, which he did for many more years until he decided to quietly retire by changing the TR in his name to a K, dyeing his skin blue, learning to honk his nose, and hanging out with his friends down in Bluffington. Crashing trains into each other was big fun now, and more importantly, it was big business, which means everyone wanted a piece of it like a disgusting cake that falls apart in the late stage. That's a capitalism joke, by the way, for all 4% of my audience who aren't high-profile Wall Street bankers like I am. The point is, train crashing was the new way to drum up a quick buck and everyone was getting in on it. Later that same year, five more staged train crashes occurred, including one held at a local county fair. These fun fair freight fights were starting to become the new hotness. But what's a little hotness compared to the sweltering heat of the desert? What's a fad if it doesn't have Texas stepping in to crush the competition? And this time, I mean that literally. William George Crush was a passenger agent, aka a customer service bitch boy, for the Missouri-Kansas-Texas Railroad. Now to save my voice from drying out faster than a one-legged man in a butt-kicking competition, we're gonna refer to them by their common name, the KT Railroad. You know, MKT. KT, fuck you, Missouri, I guess. Yeah, actually, no, fuck Missouri, you deserve it. The KT Railroad, unsurprisingly, was also failing around this time. Oh, right, because there was also this giant economic crash in 1890 called the Panic of 1890, and that's probably why the fucking Cleveland Railroad was failing, and I didn't mention that, because who cares, this video is about crashing some choo-choo trains. Anywho, the KT Railroad was trying their best to expand during the economic downturn, and had recently upgraded all of their steam engines with new, wildly powerful for the era 60-ton models. This meant they had a stockpile of 30 to 35-ton models laying around not doing a gosh dang thing. So here comes Crush again with an idea that will hopefully save him from a monotonous life of saying, well, I'm sorry you feel that way, let me see what I can do to assist you. Can I place you on a brief hold? Crush had just recently been to a staged train crash. The one he went to in particular was a special occasion, because it was put on by the Columbus and Hawking Valley Railroad, or Cocking Railroad for short. The Cocking Railroad had also just recently erected and owned Buckeye Park right next to the site where they demolished two of their trains into each other at high speed, and planned the big boxcar blowout to commemorate the grand opening of the park. It was a mutual advertising double-dipping win. People came via train to the site of the wreck, and while they were there, they were given a great idea for their new leisure destination, and thus the railroad generated more fares in the future from people who wanted to hang out and go to Buckeye Park, thanks to the fact that they got a preview of it when they went to watch the trains curse blowed. Now after that whole hoopla, Crush got to thinking. There was a huge uncapitalized opportunity in that whole story. Because the Cocking Railroad didn't charge people to ride to the crash site. They banked entirely on using it as an advertising platform for the future train ride destinations, which was a very large missed profit because over 20,000 people showed up to Buckeye just to watch the crash. What if... Instead of using the train wreck to promote a newly built public park, you went back to the system of charging people to watch the train crash, but also made the train crash a place people would want to go to from all across the state. 
what if what if the train crash destroyed the public park no even better what if the train crash destroyed an entire town everything's bigger in texas crush slammed down the proposal to the kt railroad and said hey guys guys you got a ton of trains you're not using anymore and this train crashing stuff is hot shit give me two of them and i'll slam them into each other for huge profit now instead of building a whole park or side hustle or what the fuck ever let's build a mock town and offer train rides to it from anywhere in texas we'll charge the same rate for a round trip from anywhere in the state so people all over Texas will be interested in coming. I mean, the Buckeye Park Rec gathered like a crowd of 20,000 people. Now imagine how much green we could stash if we charged a whopping $3.50 per ride ticket. We would be rich forever. Do I really need to pop in to my own video and remind you all of inflation? I know there's at least one of you out there who thought it meant $3.50 in today's money and scoffed thinking this was, oh boy, who, oh boy, oh wow. $3.50, oh boy, what a huge vent. Well, $3.50 back in 1896 was about $125 today, which means if KT Railroad hit that goal of 20,000 people, they would be sitting on about a cool two and a half million dollars gross. Wow, that's normally a terrible and unsafe idea, said the heads of the KT Railroad with their mustaches billowing and their top hats falling off in disgust. But we are in a huge economic downturn, and somehow that one railroad wreck made the Cleveland Railroad not crash and burn any harder. So fuck it. We like your idea. What do you call it? Now Crush, being a very clever and forward-thinking man, said, We'll name the fake town after myself. We'll call it Crush. And we'll call the event Crash at Crush. I would have called it Crush Crash Course, but whatever. Here's the location on Google Maps. Let's go ahead and use Street View. It would have been right... Right over there. Right over there. Wow, what a boring shithole. Back in the pioneer times, the speed limit was usually limited to 55 miles an hour, because if your horse could go any faster than that, you would break time dilation. No matter how fast I go, I can't... I can't catch up to these fucking guys. This truck is doing one of two things. Either it's experiencing commerce, or it's trying to drive... to hell, I guess. It's fucking gone. Perhaps most interesting enough is, if you zoom out on the map, you'll see that this location is just north of Waco, Texas. And if we zoom out a bit more, you can find out that Waco is approximately in between Dallas and Austin. And if you keep zooming out from there, you'll see that all of this is in the state of Texas. Now, if we zoom out just a little bit more, that's Texas, United States, specifically the southern part of the United States. But stick with me. If you zoom out even further, you can see the entire continent of North America. Now, there are seven continents. A lot of people don't know that, especially because Antarctica is hidden all the way down here at the most southernest point of the world ever. And if we zoom in here, you can find the San Martin base. Now, if we use Street View once again, you can see something very interesting about this part of Antarctica. Number one, there appears to be a tear in the fabric of reality in Antarctica, and I don't know why scientists aren't investigating this closer. But number two, and keen-eyed viewers will be able to point this out by looking at the area, this would be a terrible location for a staged train crash. There's way too much snow, there's no established railroads. Customers from Texas would have to cross the entire South Pacific Ocean or South America to get here. And again, there's tears in the fabrics of reality just sitting everywhere. Crush's choice of building the town outside of Waco was a tactical stroke of genius. And I now have an idea for killing two birds with one stone by simultaneously creating my 100 million subscriber special and filling the desperately untapped market of state 
staging train crashes for the researchers down in Antarctica. But that's a video for next year when I finally hit 100 million subscribers. And the town of Crush was legit. They drilled water wells so people could get water if they were too frail and weak to stand up to the moderate Texas heat. Telegraph offices were built so people could message their friends about how they could spin this thing off into a musical festival called Burning Man about a hundred years in the future. A giant grandstand was constructed for announcers to sit at and presenters to shout things at the crowd from, complete with three large speakers and a separate section called the Forsaken Zone, which is where reporters would sit. The Ringling Brothers Circus even lent them a tent so that a makeshift restaurant could be constructed. But then, the Ringling Brothers looked at each other in unison and said, we can use this to make money too! And soon that flourished into a makeshift carnival, complete with everything a 19th century child could ask for. Game booths, scam salesman shows, and cigar vendors. This was back when people actually gave a huge shit about the circus, by the way, so the pre-party to the event was becoming just as worthwhile as going to as the actual crash itself. Okay, whatever. It was just like any other local county fair, so what? You say as you remember the most exciting thing to happen to you this month is you found a coupon for a fast food restaurant you enjoy? Well, Crush hired two to three hundred Texas Rangers to keep the peace for particularly rowdy patrons. And apparently they did a pretty fucking bad job because they also had to erect an entire wooden jailhouse just to hold some of the more debaucherous types. Texas was now experiencing the only flood it had seen since the biblical times. People were pouring into Crush Town by the literal train full. Trains cycled in and out continuously to see the show and hang out in the hoopla going around. While all projections expected 20 to 25,000 people, over 40,000 looky-loos showed up just to see these trains get it on. Let me put it another way. Statistically, for the time that the event was going on, Crush was in the top three largest cities in Texas, combated only by Dallas and Houston. Now, we'll never know who was officially first because census data back then was largely unreliable because the southern United States wouldn't invent larger numbers until 1998. And even then, I think they're still currently stuck on 42 million. Let me know in the comments what the highest number you've ever heard of is. Now, I once heard some jack off in downtown try to tell me there's a number that technically never ends called infinity, but I slapped his cheeks and then slapped his face because that makes no fucking sense whatsoever. By a statistics standpoint, the operation was already a huge success, but setting up all this fanfare just to not deliver on the golden goose would be a business game over. So it was time to get down to business. A a four mile long track was built in the middle of the desert, mostly to keep the spectacle separate from the main KD lines to prevent an actual accident. One of the engineers produced a giant metal spearhead battering ram that he planned to weld to the front of one of the trains to see if it could cleanly slice the other one directly down the middle, but Crush stopped him and said, no, no. We save that for when we take over Austin. Both ends of the track were at the top of a hilly area with the middle of the track in a slight dipped valley. Just to really add to the let's get these fuckers going as fast as possible factor. Crush had acquired two 35 ton decommissioned engines, numbers 999 and 1001. Engine 1000 is what he was hoping the two would fuse into like go tanks, but he had a good feeling they wouldn't get the fusion dance right in time just before Majin Buu decided Decided to eliminate all of humanity from Kami's lookout. The trains also got hooked up with a set of boxcars for advertising on the side. Another genius stroke to both make the crash as spectacular as possible to add more momentum and to just generate even more bankroll off of the rotting rail cars. The safe distance for the crowd was set at about 200 yards away from the projected crash zone, but the press, fresh from eating the soul of a baby goat, were allowed to stand at about 100 yards away. 
Some spectators tried to push them directly onto the tracks to do humanity a favor, but they were scared away by the guttural wails and flailing tentacles the press hurled back at them in defense. Once the crowd had been contained, the trains were rolled to the center of the track for publicity photos, and then slowly back to the opposite ends of the track. Crush rode to the center of the festivities on a white horse, wearing a 10-gallon hat so large it could hold 20 gallons. He took it off and waved it around, which was the signal to get this show on the road, the railroad. Both trains fired up, the engineers bailed, the engines both reached 50 miles per hour, and just like that mega church you drive by on the highway, our entertainment was in God's hands now. How much do you know about how a steam engine works? There's probably a few dozen train aficionados and historians out there watching the video who slowly went wide-eyed because they pieced together what's going to happen next. Well, them and a few thousand other people who watched a video on this topic made by someone else on YouTube, but to those people specifically I say, are you cheating on me? How dare you? I thought I was your exclusive content creator. What do you mean they upload five days a week? Quality over quantity, you entertainment bimbo! There's a lot of technical know-how and specifics we really don't need to get into, mostly because I'm too lazy to learn intricately about train engines. But what you do need to know specifically is steam engines operate by creating steam that in turn generates a lot of pressure, which then pushes mechanisms in the engine to propel forward, often through the use of a boiler. What do you think would happen if that engine had a lot of pressure, like too much pressure, or maybe potentially even worse, a sudden dramatic increase in pressure well over safety rated limits? Everything's bigger in Texas. The trains collided, and at that exact moment, both engines on both trains simultaneously exploded. The crash at Crush had just detonated a 70-ton bomb of wood and steel in the middle of a crowd of 40 thousand people. People screamed and scattered. Debris rocketed into the masses. Six people were seriously injured and two were instantly killed by high velocity shrapnel. Both trains and their attached boxcars were instantaneously demolished and clumped together into an unsalvageable mess of labor parts. Each and every bit and bobble on board was contorted into the other forming one mangled metal corpse from two fresh trains. Then, there was but a second or two of silence as the roaring cacophony of noise calmed down, which led to pockets of the crowd lifting their hands in the air and going, Woo! Yeah! Yeah! Fuck yeah! Oh, yeah! Everyone loved it. The climax had been well worth the buildup. People thought this was the most amazing thing they had ever seen. Even though people were fucking dead, hordes from the crowd began to scramble all over the wreckage, gathering pieces of the entire catastrophe to smuggle home as souvenirs of what they had just witnessed. One Civil War veteran in attendance even said the entire spectacle was more frightening than the Battle of Gettysburg. I I have never been more jealous of 19th century peasants in my entire life than I am right now, but here we are. During the commotion, one of the lead engineers of the whole project approached Crush and said, Oh my god, sir, oh, I don't know, I don't know what happened. We ran tests beforehand and reinforced the vehicles, and we were positive the boilers wouldn't explode. That's all real, by the way. This is a disaster. People are dead. What are we gonna- But Crush? put a finger to the man's lips and said, Hush! Listen. 
They love it. We did it. We lived up to God's pioneer dream of a great Southern America. Everything truly is bigger in Texas. The press did their job and conducted a ritual to return their currently cherished Antichrist to this mortal plane. But once that was done, they did their secondary job and began reporting like crazy. The crash at Crush instantly became national news, with headlines flying out left and right about how this whole event made the Wang Gong Cheng explosion of 1626 look like baby's first fireworks show. Word of the event got back to the Katy Railroad bigwigs, who would by this point probably pick their top hats off the floor and grown even more impressive mustaches, they instantly went into damage control mode and fired the shit out of Crush. People dying and getting killed is bad for business, they said. After all, every death means one less potential customer. But something really, really cool happened that I think objectively proves people today are gigantic cowards who do nothing interesting anymore. Instead of complaining about the danger of the event on social media, and then promptly forgetting that it even happened a week later because no one actually really cares about tragedy unless it happens to them personally. Instead of that, people loved it. They loved all of it. They loved everything that happened. The crash at Crush was a huge success. The KD Railroad found itself not only swimming in a pool of instantaneous sales dollars, but people were purchasing trip packages and regular tickets left and right. Part of this was because KD Railroad swiftly and quietly paid off anyone who sought compensation for death or injury from the crash, meaning all the public at large saw was how the whole thing was fucking incredible and an amazing spectacle of crashing. I seriously cannot stop thinking about how badly I want to do this in real life. Make me a gigantic YouTuber. I swear, I swear to God, I will at some point buy two bullet trains and do this at over 200 miles an hour. This is my new mission. I just need money and to be famous. Within the next day, KD Railroad executives telegrammed Crush and said, oh, did we say you were fired? No, 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 you're hired. Uh, again, double hired. We never want you to worry about not working with us. You're our golden goose and we love you. Mwah. Crush worked for another 60-ish years at the KD Railroad before he officially retired. And although there were staged train wrecks before this one, the crash at Crush was the one that kickstarted the entire phenomenon. It was now a good old American pastime to smash steam engines into each other for fun. You saw these things everywhere. County fairs, amusement parks, circus sideshows, hospital grand openings, the front lawn of the White House, you name it. The whole thing was now as ubiquitous and regular to the American people as watching people play video games with amusing commentary is to the internet. Oh, and speaking of which, I, well, that's a weird organic coincidence we got there. I started a gaming channel Channel called Hugby's Gamer Mode, which I've got linked in the description if you want to check it out. You can also just search on YouTube, it's real simple to do. It's a great way to get even more content from me while I work on videos like this one that I initially assume will be about 10 minutes long, and then I just keep finding more and more and more and more cool information that slowly creeps this up to the hour-long mark. I originally just wanted to talk about the Crash of Crush, but then I found A.L. Streeter and what we're going to talk about next, and it just never ends when you decide to spend an entire week reading about trains in the 1800s. And now, train crashing needed its superstar, its big name to transcend the sport and bring in people from all walks of life to check out what was going on. Train crashing needed its Michael Jordan, or its Tiger Woods, or its OJ Simpson. It needed Joe Connolly better known as Head On Joe. Again, as far as I can tell, there are no surviving photos of Joe Connolly, so thanks to the magic of AI, he looked exactly like this. Head On Joe wasn't a man who lived as a lifelong advocate of an anti-migraine medication. He was a professional train smasher, credited with destroying over 146 locomotives in his lifetime between 1896 and 1932. Joe actually dreamt of crashing trains into each other ever since he 
was a child. In 1933, he wrote an autobiographical article chronicling his time as Grandmaster of Gravy Train Grenades. Joe said, quote, I believe that somewhere in the makeup of every normal person there lurks a suppressed desire to smash things up. Yes. Yes, it does. Joe witnessed some train smashings and knew that his childhood dream and experience in theater could come together to make him the King Crash Kahuna. He approached the State Fair of Des Moines, Iowa, where he lived, and said, For just $5,000, I can put a crash that'll suck your dick and knock your socks off, not in that order. Now, this was still 1896, so that would be about over $180,000 today. A paltry sum for a city that people would actually care about, but for Des Des Moines, my estimate is that's about 11 million times the state of Iowa's entire budget. They cut a different deal to give Joe $3,000 a cut of ticket sales and they'd suck his dick instead. Joe agreed and on September 9th, 1896, Joe officially entered the train wreck business, which unfortunately was a week before the crash at Crush put the entire industry on the map. Joe's wreck was far from a failure, however, bringing in 5,000 people, each paying 50 cents a ticket. From there, he gathered up his share of the profits and used them to start a touring railroad destruction company across the entire United States. But in the back of his mind, Joe always compared his shows to the landmark Crush Crash, which opened his eyes to the potential for his stunts to only get crazier. Now we finally get to talk about why I put Joe Connolly on my wall of people who I'm spiritually linked to. Right next to Lawn Chair Larry and Fighting Jack Churchill. Links to those videos on both of those guys in the description if you want to hear about more dudes who make everyone else in history look boring. One of the first ways Joe reinvented the game was to really play up the angle of giving the trains competing names. His biggest achievement on this was to name the trains after the two leading presidential candidates candidates during election years. Since Joe knew the quickest way to get people invested and pissed off was to bring in politics. And by the way, just so we're clear, I believe whatever you believe in politically, and I hate everyone who doesn't. But getting the crowd ready to start a fight before the train fight wasn't good enough. So he began loading the train's boxcars with gasoline so that the crash would start a roaring fire, burning the remains throughout the night. A celebratory bonfire to complement the smash and crash spectacle. But warming the buns of anyone who wanted to see the burnt box car still wasn't good enough. So Joe began strapping dynamite to the front of the trains so they would explode as much as humanly fucking possible when they collided. Joe tallied up train fatalities all the way until 1932, where he put on his final wreck at the Iowa State Fair, which fittingly featured trains named Roosevelt and Hoover. After the pieces fell where they may, all Joe had to say about the entire thing to reporters was, well, that's that, before he walked away from the whole thing, presumably suffering train crash burnout, which is a real mental problem for the people in the train derailment industry. Stage train wrecks seemed like they were an unstoppable force of fun and funding, and for the next three years, people thought these could last forever! If you remember the beginning of the video, I said this party train continued until a certain historical event ruined everything for everyone, and now... Uh, well, you know, honestly, that statement may have been a bit disingenuous and perhaps too narrow in scope. The thing that killed intentional train crashes once and for all killed a lot of things once and for all, including lives and livelihoods. I'm talking about the Great Depression. Yeah, unfortunately, with the influx of the largest financial crisis in modern history, people needed to change what they spent things on until the 40s rolled around to finally say, hey, I got a great place for your money, the military, because without it, you're gonna die. The Great Depression meant scrimping, scraping, saving, scrapping, and sucking it up. Crashing old locomotives into each other just seemed like a total waste of desperately needed materials. Even if the engines were fully decommissioned, they contained precious metal and other things that could be recycled into... Well, realistically, absolutely anything, because anything else would be better for the economy than just actively watching money burn. Which leads me to my question. Why don't we do this anymore? 
we're all strong and rich in America now, and hell, we could do this 10 times bigger with modern technology. Why isn't this a staple of the local county fair when it comes to town? Well, my theory on why this all stopped is why travel all the way to see this sort of thing when you can do it at home? The movie industry blossomed alongside the Great Depression, with the 20s and 30s becoming landmark years in the development of talking picture shows. Entertainment was now reaching a point where convenience outweighed the fun of exploration. Let's imagine it's 1952. Yeah, I suppose I could travel four hours by train to go to the middle of the desert to watch a one-time crash that lasts a few seconds, or I could just get in my car and go to the local movie theater and watch this scene from Denver and Rio Grande. And being an unobservant audience member from 1952, I probably wouldn't have even noticed that their pyrotechnics went off a bit early. Is it the same thing? Not even close, but for most people, it's close enough. Hell, let's scale this up to being a modern day thing. Mission Impossible 7 features an entire real life train wreck practical effect. What do you think the majority of people would rather do? Plan ahead to go God knows where in the middle of nowhere America and see something like that for themselves? Or would they rather just watch the two minute clip of that stunt on YouTube when it eventually makes the rounds on social media? Some of you out there are with me in living an exciting, no compromise life and want to see this stuff in person to feel the impact, to hear the explosions, and to just feel fucking alive but unfortunately most people aren't as cool as us and the overhead of doing all of this for real isn't ever going to outweigh the simulated alternatives in terms of business sense it just makes more financial sense to put a huge stunt like this on camera and wrap a whole movie around it for potentially hundreds of millions of dollars in return or for an even more modern audience upload it to scrounge up advertising revenue through the internet's infinite view generations rather rather than trying to sell tickets to a one-time event. Or hell, let's look at more modern practical alternatives. Do we find a bunch of old trains, build a self-isolated train track for them out in the middle of the desert, and try to get a crowd together for a huge singular impact? Or do we plop some very readily available and cheap junker cars in the middle of a dirt lot and run them over with monster trucks for over an hour at the same ticket price? Which one gives the audience prolonged immediate gratification in a world increasing its demand for that every day? And which one makes them sit around for potentially hours just for one climax before they have to go home and clean up? Monster truck rallies, along with destruction alternatives like demolition derbies, fireworks displays, and public building implosions, are also a hell of a lot safer for the viewing audience. With our automobile and drip-feed dopamine-dependent society, it's almost impossible for this type of entertainment to return, beyond the occasional one-off someone might do for the novelty of it of, oh hey, you remember trains? What if we crash those old things no one uses anymore just for fun? And admittedly, it makes me a bit sad knowing all I'll most likely never see two bullet trains joust each other head on. No, that's the end of the video. There's no positive takeaway this time. I'm actually kind of fucking pissed. We're never going to see two fully loaded bullet trains collide into each other at mock speed while equipped with giant metal wedges in the front to try to slice cleanly through one another. Oh, you know what? Hey, I know it'll cheer me up. Let's check in on that steakhouse again. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, shit. Oh, he's doing it. I'm actually really happy. I didn't think this would be happening. Oh, man. Oh, he's getting read the rules. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I didn't think this would happen. Holy sh... Does this happen regularly in Texas? I did... All right. While this guy cuts into a steak, because I read the rules, you're allowed to cut into the steak once and try it to see, make sure that it's cooked to your specifications. <laughs> this is happening. I was... This was a bit... The, the video is saved. Oh my god, he's doing it. Are they starting it up? They're starting! Holy shit! I'm gonna sit here for an hour and watch this man eat a steak. I wish- there's no audio. There's unfortunately no audio. I'm gonna have to put some royalty-free Texas Western music in the background. Oh my god. I want to exemplify to you, my viewers, this was a joke. 
I, I thought I was going to spy another empty restaurant during closing time, but someone's actually doing the steak challenge. <laughs> oh, fuck. I'm so excited. Oh, man. Okay, so he's got an extra plate. Cut it in half. Lick the grease off. Yeah, that'll lubricate it as it goes down your slop hole. This is the best moment of my career. I hope it ends here. I really hope he's just done. He has two bites and he's like, ah, oh, no, no, a little, a little too much for me. I may have underestimated 72 ounces. 70 ounces? No problem. 72? Ooh, mama. What if he's profusely sweating and just going, I really shouldn't have come from the buffet before this. Oh God, why did I have to try the 12 egg omelet challenge this morning? I probably should have done this on a different day. Yeah, you gotta be polite. You don't want to eat a piece of beef that could feed an entire African village with a little grease on your chin. That'd be disgusting. The best part of this is I'm probably the first person to watch this steak eating camera in many, many years. No one even knows this thing's still running. It's just tucked in the corner of the restaurant, slowly whittling away, running on a server with Windows XP. It's like a Logitech webcam one, serial number one. And yet, here we are. Oh, he's doing it, man. That's so, he, oh, I could do that. I could do this. You take me to the gym, I get a good pump. I haven't eaten all day. I sit down, I could eat 72 ounces of beef. Although what I probably don't know is in the rules, you also have to eat everything included in the meal. That guy's got to swallow that fucking fork. Take your time, baby cakes. You got 53 minutes. We're very proud of you. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to show this guy's face for legality reasons, but I don't care. I'll blur it if he complains. If, if, if he, if this guy has a problem with it, the man eating a stack of beef big enough to smother a man with a Snorlax fetish, I will censor and blur his face, but I am doing nothing but cheering him on. I am Goku spirit bombing this thing with my hands lifted to give him energy. I want to see this happen. I cannot believe that someone Someone is eating... <laughs> Someone is eating a 72-ounce steak. <laughs> at 11 o'clock at night. Oh, this man lives large. I love him. Hey, Hugbees, I heard that last week all you did was Google trains and like 1800s train stuff. What'd you do this weekend? I watched a man eat 72 ounces of meat at 11 o'clock at night in texas <laughs> i love my job oh fuck oh fuck what they just played a fucking trap card on him he has to eat all that too fuck off the dude's got a fully loaded baked potato a salad and a full steak and they added what looks like potato chips a bowl of gravy and rolls Fuck off! Don't look at me. Eat your fucking food. Don't look at me! Eat your fucking food! Don't look at me! Let's talk strategy. So, the salad is simple. You soak it in dressing, you just fucking drink it. The potatoes... Oh god, there's like two of them? The bowl of gravy is gonna be good lube going down. What is that at the top? Is that mashed potato? I don't fucking know. This is not looking good time-wise. He's only eating a quarter of the steak, and he's got... 47 minutes left. He still has all those sides to eat. I looked at the rules. You have to eat all the sides. No. What the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? What the fuck? That's not even the whole steak? There's no... No fucking way. Yeah, pull the chair off of the ghost so that they can help him eat it. That's the only way he's gonna... We have a new challenger. And he's built like a rail track. Wait, he only has to eat the... He only has to... Where are his sides? Throw up, throw up, throw up, throw up, throw up. <gasps> Ew. He just poured the fucking gravy juice in... Oh, he's doing it again. Okay, you know what? That's worse than throwing up on there. Look, I'm a big fan of gravy. I am, but that's... That's a lot. All right, so we're gonna time-lapse the footage a bit here because unfortunately I've got bad news for you guys from the future.
You'll notice that there's two minutes and 30 seconds on the clock for Shaved Head Man. And he still has a handful of salad, a handful of steak, and a handful of regrets. Meanwhile, Beard Man, who almost caused a catastrophic boot spill, seems to have given up entirely. And so, Shaved Head's time expires, and admitting defeat in full, the beard guy gets a to-go box for his unrealistic and overall excessive piece of meat. You know what they say, everything's bigger in Texas, including losers. <laughs>